us our reading today. And then Andrew is going to bring us the second part of his sermon. The first part was last week on the Apostle Paul and the second part today on the Apostle Paul and his message. So our Bible reading this morning is from Acts chapter 26 um, and it's part of Paul's defense before King Agrippa, beginning at verse 12. On one of these journeys, I was going to Damascus with the authority and commission of the chief priests. About noon, O King, as I was on the road, I saw a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, blazing around me and my companions. We all fell to the ground, and I heard a voice saying to me in Aramaic, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. Then I asked, who are you, Lord? I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, the Lord replied. Now get up and stand on your feet. I have appeared to you to appoint you as a servant and as a witness of what you have seen of me and what I will show you. I will rescue you from your own people and from the Gentiles. I am sending you to them to open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God so that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. So then, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the vision from heaven, first to those in Damascus and then to those in Jerusalem and in all Judea and to the Gentiles also. I preached that they should repent and turn to God and to prove their repentance by their deeds. That is why the Jews seized me in the temple courts and tried to kill me. But I have had God's help to this very day. And so I stand here and testify to small and great alike. I am saying nothing beyond what the prophets and Moses said would happen, that the Christ would suffer and as the first to rise from the dead would proclaim light to his own people and to the Gentiles. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So if you're here last week, I spoke on Paul, the man, the the background of his life as a fervent Jew, his encounter with Jesus on the road to Damascus, as we just read, Uh, His call to plant churches around the Mediterranean world, the the passion of his life for Christ. So, having talked about the man, I was going to talk more about the message. And uh, so his message is contained in the 13 letters or books, 13 out of the 27 books in the New Testament ascribed to Paul. So some of you are thinking... This is going to be interesting how Andrew's going to cover 13 books of the New Testament in less than 20 minutes. Or you're worrying that the barbecue could be late. Um, But anyway, let's pray, shall we, before I start. So, Father, thank you for this time together this morning as we consider your word. We pray that, Lord, you will open our eyes, uh, that we may receive your light in our hearts and walk closer with you, in Jesus' name. Amen. So I I said last week that a lot of Christians do find it hard going sometimes to get through some of Paul's letters. Uh, Some parts of those letters are not the easiest to read. And um, that's why I thought we'd have a reading from Acts, because it's in the sermons, or his defences on trial, that Paul almost kind of best encapsulates the message that he was given. So from that reading, let me just pull out what I thought were the key phrases in what he's, how he's expressing the gospel to King Agrippa. So 
God has promised the Jew, God promised the Jews a Messiah, but a Messiah who will suffer. That Messiah was Jesus, and God raised Jesus from the dead after his suffering. And God now offers through Jesus Christ his salvation to Jews and Gentiles alike. Well, that's reasonably straightforward, isn't it? That's reasonably straightforward. Obviously, there's a lot behind it, isn't there? And that word Messiah, or the title of the King of the Jews, uh, translated into Greek is the word Christ. Jesus Christ is not a name. Jesus the Christ is his title. And that word, the Christ, has the sense of the anointed one. So I was reminded of that yesterday. Because the, the most sacred and holy moment of that service was when they anointed him, wasn't it? Behind those screens, because it was so sacred and so holy, the anointed one. And it all draws on Christ and the theme of kingship down through the Old Testament. So that was, that's one half of the message, God's revelation. And then Paul explains to Agrippa the second part, which is how do we respond We repent of our sins, we turn to God in faith, we receive his forgiveness, and then we live as a member of Christ's own people. And that's the gospel, the good news, the hope for the world. And you think, well, that, gosh, that was pretty straightforward as well, wasn't it? I kind of, I've been on an Alpha course and I get that. I get that's what it's about. So why did Paul write those 13 letters? having summed it up so succinctly. Four of those letters he wrote to individuals, Timothy, Titus, and Philemon. Six short letters, fairly short letters, which you can read in half an hour or less, to five churches, and then three long letters, the letters to Romans and 1 and 2 Corinthians. And have you ever thought it's interesting that he could have written 13 volumes of theology you know, perhaps with a test at the end of each one. But that, but that would have turned Christianity into a qualification rather than a way of life. So what he wrote was letters to real people in real places facing real problems and real questions. That's why the New Testament is as it is. But that's what kind of presents us with a challenge when we read them because We aren't living in the first century. We're living in the 21st century. Paul's letters tend to go a bit like this. In the first part, he'll set out some understanding of God, the person and work of Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, what we may refer to as the theology of the letters. And then in the second part, he'll go into sort of practical teaching and guidance on how to live as a Christian, what you might be described as the ethics of the Christian life, or the spirituality of the Christian life. Now, I've noticed in churches nowadays, British, particularly British churches, you know, that we spend a lot of time on the second part of what Paul tends to say, because we are practical people. You know, we want to get down to what difference does this make and how I should live. But Paul understood something that we neglect at our peril, which is that the ethics and the spirituality is built on the theology. Because what you believe will determine how you behave. And that's why some Christians struggle, because they're trying to behave without thinking through what do they actually believe. So to give you an example, Paul wrote to the Ephesians, forgive one another as God in Christ has forgiven you. So if we are in church with resentments in our hearts and hurts in our hearts and unforgiveness in our hearts, we should reflect on Oh, Christ has forgiven me. Christ has forgiven me. God, let me forgive. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who have sinned against us. 
So that is the pattern of the letter. But what I have found helpful in reading Paul's letters is, as I said a few moments ago, to try to understand more the context of it. What is the context of it? If I could appreciate that, I'd understand why he's saying certain things. So I'd like to give you a kind of picture here of Paul's world. I'm not very good with pictures. I I always tend to end up with text, but at least you've got a diagram, okay? And you might remember the diagram. So this was Paul's world. And in it, you could think of there were three powers, three influences that shaped the world in which he lived and the world to which he needed to bring his message. As a Jew, there was obviously the world of Israel, the nation of Israel, the nation of the Old Testament, with their law of Moses, with the temple in Jerusalem where they worshipped. And then there was the world of Greece. He was brought up, as we saw last week, in a Greek city. And Greece was famous for its philosophy, but it was also noted for its idolatry and all those pagan gods, and its immorality, particularly its sexual promiscuity. And then in Rome, of course, was the power of the age. He lived within the Roman Empire with its emperor. And um, I don't know if you know this, but the Roman emperor was called Son of God and Lord and Saviour. We'll come back to that in a moment. But that's how, the Ro- that's how the Romans describe their emperor. Now, you may think, well, yeah, that's, that's kind of the problem, Andrew, because uh, I'm not a Jew, and uh, I don't speak Greek, and uh, I don't live under the power of Rome. Well, at least not since Brexit. Okay? <laughs> so... You're going to think, is this relevant? You know, so how is this relevant to me? You know, we don't, we don't have those idols anymore. But, but a lot of British men do worship idols under such names as Manchester United. <laughs> and um, that's a cheer from the Manchester City fans, but you're in the, you're in the same boat. You're in the same boat. And, and with Rome here, you know, you think, well, we don't worship emperors anymore. But you should see how some of the Russians respond to Putin or how some of the Americans respond to Trump. Yeah? So into this world, into this world in which he lived, there was an explosion. Jesus Christ and his people. All of a sudden in this world there was a fourth power, a fourth influence a fourth message. And I put here Jesus Christ and his people. I initially wrote Jesus Christ and his church, but I thought that might give you the wrong impression because we think of church as an institution with buildings. But this is the first century. The church wasn't an institution and it didn't have any buildings. It was just groups of people meeting in houses. And these people, these ordinary people... Some slaves, some free men, some men, some women, some rich, most poor. These groups of people face these three powers. And Paul had to give them a message on what the gospel meant in relation to these powers and what they needed to do in order to live for Christ in that kind of world. Now, what we have to do is kind of translate this into our kind of 21st century context. And actually, it's not that difficult. Because, and there's a lot one could say here, but here, here, here's my kind of three examples. Because we live in a world where, like so many of the Jews of the first century, religion was defined in terms of rules. You're circumcised as a child. You keep the Sabbath, you obey the food laws, you keep all the rules, and you'll be all right with God. And that is a view that hasn't disappeared in our world, has it? People think, if I keep the rules, I'll be okay with God, and I'll get to heaven. 
And then we live in a world like the Greeks did, where we are surrounded by that secular culture and its values. I was, I was in the Chinese takeaway a week or so ago, and I was having to wait a long time. So they had the sun on the table, and I, I thought, I'd never read the sun. <laughs> but I haven't got anything else to read. So I kind of took, and I thought, I, I flipped through the first eight pages, and I thought, what I'm reading here is soft pornography. We are just surrounded by that culture and values and the more time we spend on the media the more time we absorb it don't we we just absorb it what is antithetical to our christianity and then we live under a state power now in our country despite your criticisms and whoever you voted for last week we live under a relatively benign state power unlike paul did I mean, in the Roman world, the Romans kept peace as long as you agreed with their politics and religion. And if you didn't, they killed you. That was the kind of the choice that you were faced, that you were faced with. But for many Christians down through the ages, up until today, this is a real issue, isn't it? The state power they live under. You wouldn't want to be a Christian, really, in North Korea, but some are. I only read this week that In a typical week, 10 Christians are killed in Nigeria for their faith. Afghanistan, Iran. We are fortunate that we don't live in that kind of situation, but many, many Christians around the world do. So what Paul says on this subject is of burning importance to them. So how does Paul present his gospel into these contexts. Well, this is why he wrote 13 letters, okay? So, but I would say we could just try to express it in this way. To those people who came from a background of religion as rules, he said, in Jesus Christ, it's about faith, not rules. It's about faith. We become right with God through faith in Jesus Christ. For those of you who had a sprinkling of Protestant theology during your attendance at church, you know, this is what's referred to as justification by faith. Now, I can see the people who've read some theology, they're smiling at me. You know, they're, oh, I know that, Andrew, I know that. Yeah. But rightness with God through faith. Isn't this a kind of liberating message? Isn't this, a, this is, if you understand this, you will understand what a liberating message this is. I don't have to try to please God by being good enough because you will never feel good enough. And that's why keeping religion as rules produces condemnation because you never feel good enough. You never feel good enough. But faith frees you from that condemnation. That is what the letter to the Galatians is all about, if you read it. It's about the freedom of faith in Jesus Christ. God has put me right. God has put me right through him. Then what about the circular culture? Now here, you you should read 1 Corinthians. I mean, there's... um, Sometimes people get all idealistic, don't they? And say, we should get back to the early church. Have you ever heard that phrase? You know, we should get back to the early church. You wouldn't want to get back to the early church in Corinth, given the choice. Philippians, were, yeah, I'd be happy to go to Philippi. But Corinth, what a mixed up church that was. They had a load of problems because they were saturated with that Greek culture of idolatry, pride, Trust in human wisdom, divisiveness, all kinds of misbehavior. And that's why they got a long letter, really. Because it's a letter that tries to sort out their problems as a church. And their problems were caused by their absorption in their culture. I wonder how many problems in the church today are caused by people's absorption in a false culture, in an unchristian culture. 
So the Greeks, for all their wisdom, Paul says, yeah, you know, the Greeks have got all of this wisdom, but you have to understand this. Wisdom or knowledge, as they see it, puffs up people, but love builds up people. Yeah, we give so much time and attention to science and technology, and we're all into artificial intelligence at the moment. But what transforms people is love. What transforms people is love. And in 1 Corinthians, that is where there's the famous passage about love in chapter 13, where Paul starts off by saying, but I'll show you a more excellent way. I will show you a more excellent way. The way of love. And then, what about this aspect? Well, as I've already touched upon, uh, this is something, you know, which I find, I mean, I've been a Christian for a long time, but this aspect, I've realized, we seriously underplay in the church. We don't appreciate how radical and revolutionary in a political sense was Paul's message because when he said Jesus Christ is Lord the reaction from the authorities was oh hang on a minute Caesar is Lord that is a treasonous statement and just to remind you of how serious this issue is when Jesus was on trial before Pilate the accusation that, as it were, did it for him was then they, when they said, anyone who claims to be a king opposes Caesar. And what was on the cross when Jesus died? The king of the Jews. The king of the Jews. And as with Paul, how did Paul's life end? Executed by the state for his faith. So Paul has this message which raises against the power of Rome what he calls our citizenship in heaven. That's a lovely phrase, isn't it? He says to the, he says to the Philippians, our citizenship is in heaven. That is our hope. Our hope is not in this world, in the powers of this world. Our citizenship is in heaven from where our Lord Jesus Christ shall come. From where our Lord Jesus Christ shall come again. Shall come again. I, I came across a phrase in one of Bishop Wright's books this week where I just thought I'd share this with you. I thought this was quite beautiful. He says, in the cross, in the cross, God, Rome's naked power Uh, was Rome's naked power was transformed into a symbol of God's naked love. Stumbled over that a bit, but that's, that's, that's the transforming message. In the cross, that naked power of the state had been transformed into a symbol of God's love for us. So we should let just Paul speak in his own words. So I chose this passage As I said last week, whenever you read Paul, you, you must never get too far away. You never get too far away from Christ. The burden of his message was Jesus Christ. And in Philippians 2, he expresses it like this. It's, this is a poem, actually. This is written as a poem. Christ, though being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be exploited, but emptied himself taking the nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. And therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. We, um, 
We sung about that earlier. You sung about that earlier. Your majesty, I can but bow. I lay my all before you now. When you spend time reading Paul, considering Paul, you finally come to the realisation that ultimately you don't understand Paul's message through your head. The only way to fully understand it is on your knees. That's what this is saying, isn't it? Not just at the name of Jesus you'll think differently or you'll have a better understanding or you'll be grade one in theology but oh, at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow and that's the question Paul leaves with us are you one of those every are you one of those every this morning that at the name of Jesus you too have bowed amen Shall we pray? Lord, we thank you for the message of Paul that speaks not only to our heads but to our hearts, not only to our minds but our bodies. Thank you, Lord, that he was that faithful messenger of Christ that preached your gospel, that called people to faith, to hope, to love, and also to obedience to the name of the one that he loved. And may we love him too. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.